Welcome, everyone. Glad to see you here tonight. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, uh, we worked together here at Cvent for about three years, uh, up until the end of 2016. Um, so it's fun to be back. I feel like it's like, you know, you go back somewhere, like going back home after you've been away for a while, like to your parents' home, like you shift into like an old pattern. That's how I feel like I came in and someone walked up to me. And I was like, yeah, welcome. Wait, why am I welcoming you? Like, I'm, <laughs> I don't work here anymore. So anyway, so tonight I want to talk about quality uh, in, in respect to leadership. So a lot of times we talk about quality and we immediately go to how am I going to test a thing or is this thing correct or right? Is there software I need to do that? And, and we'll kind of touch on those and I'll use some examples that hopefully you guys can, can reference in your day-to-day -day work and kind of how you can become uh, more of a leader on a day-to-day -day basis uh, through your quality work and through the things you do uh, at your own jobs or outside of your jobs. So the question is, you know, how do you stand apart? How, how do you become a leader? How are you seen as a leader? Is it better process? Is it more automation, stricter standards? Is it your job title? Like what makes you a leader? Basically, you just have to be a leader. There isn't something that makes you a leader. And we're gonna talk about the elements that comprise leadership. And so leadership is something that you know, you do to level up. It's something that you step out of your normal day to day. You're not just doing tasks. You actually want to step into uh, a position where people see you as someone more than the, the, the guy, the gal who's doing a thing over here, right? They're coming to you for resource. So what is a leader? What does it actually mean? Um, there's three key things I want you guys to take away. A leader is inclusive, a leader is responsible, and a leader is trustworthy. So we're gonna dig into each one of those three, and I think there's elements that you're gonna be able to take away from that when, uh, once we go through this. But I think if you can just remember those, and we'll hit them again at the end, um, these three things are crucial. And what you'll find is, as you dig in, and as you kind of live into these, these three elements, uh, you'll find that you're happier in what you do. Um, you open yourself up to more opportunities, more, um, more new interactions than maybe the normal sort of team and, and people you're, you're used to collaborating with, that begins to expand. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to it, and I think the, the number one is, is this, like, you feel better about going into work because you're making it a place that you wanna be, right? You're not just showing up, you're actually contributing and, uh, and making it the thing that it ought to be. So what does that mean practically? This is a uh, hawker stall in uh, Singapore. And imagine the street just lined with little tiny places you can eat, kind of like food carts, uh, not too different than that. But the same idea, how do you stand out, right? How do you stand out in this, just like how do you stand out as a leader? Um, there's the three kind of ways that, that relate to that inclusivity and being taking responsibility and being trustworthy is you have to engage the team around you. So you have to interact, you have to step out of just doing things and staying you know, stuck at your computer, or your, your cubicle, your desk. Uh, you need to engage the folks around you. You need to uh, basically imagine that you own your part of the business, whether that's uh, you're a brand new you know, quality engineer, whether you're a senior manager, it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum or what you do, you need to imagine that, that your sphere of influence, what if it was actually your money you were writing the checks to pay people for. What if it was actually up to you what went on in your, in your area? How would you behave? Would you behave the same? Would you behave differently, right? Just like this guy owns his little shop, he knows how much his food costs and how much it, he earns when he sells it. So he owns that part of his business and he makes choices related to that. And then lastly, I love this at the top, um, you have to have an opinion. His stall is different because it's great meals for a good cause. So a portion of everything that gets purchased there is actually going to a cause, and there's some details about it on his signage. But now it's not just I'm buying you know, chicken and rice, just like the other chicken and rice. Maybe I choose his stall because I know some portion of that is also giving back to my community. So he stands out because he actually had an opinion about his business, about his work, 
uh, how he was going to interact with his customers. Uh, and so that's a really, really vital thing. And as you think about leadership, um, I think we, we often get afraid, right? We think, I don't want to stand out because that's dangerous, that's risky, uh, when in fact, you're far more memorable and, uh, and more valuable to the people around you and the company when you do stand out and you have an opinion. So I'm gonna pause at that point for just a sec, because I do wanna address the fact that we have, uh, in any group, we have different people groups, right? We've got women, we've got people of ethnicity, we've got white folks. Um, when you come to a talk, you hear someone say leadership, or you hear them say, do a thing. I know from my women in technology group that I go to, uh, the women in leadership group that I go to, um, men and women think about roles, tasks, things like leadership very differently, as do um, people of color, immigrants. I'm a son of an immigrant. Uh, I'm very proud of it. But we look at the world through different lenses, right? And what I want to just challenge you with tonight is to not hear, oh, he's talking about leadership. That's not me, that's not my title, that's not my role, or I don't have the qualifications to do the things Andy's talking about. You do. So at least grapple with the fact that maybe in your brain you're struggling with that. And I just wanna say, um, I've watched people do it. And if you want examples, Sheetal over here is a great one. Um, she's a leader here at Cvent and someone that I respect a lot and looked up to while I worked here and still do. And so if you want a, a partner or a mentor in the process, go talk to her. Uh, and there's others, there's probably others here, right? So this is for you. Um, let that kind of sink in and, and work its way into your brain, but at least grapple with that, that dissonance if you're struggling with like, I don't know about being a leader or uh, I know quality folks especially and, the, and all the different people who really focus on quality. Your job is risk aversion, right? It is fundamentally, how do I avoid anything going wrong? And so stepping out can potentially expose you to you know, failure or potential failure. Um, so anyways, grapple with that, think about it. I, I do, I believe in each and every one of you that you can do this and, and it just takes that like step by step, right? Working your way into it. So with that, uh, we'll move on, talk about me a little bit. So this is me, uh, I have three kids, they're in pre-production. They are not quite ready to uh, go out in the world to be on their own. Um, so they're still in testing and, and iterating and, and all of that. Um, I've been married for 24 years and uh, I've done some things. So I've been in product management for two decades. I've run three of my own startups. Um, I sold Apple retail as a four-man startup and uh, we went global in every store with a little sled. If you bought a thing at an Apple store, that little sled on the iPod, that's mine. Um, we went global on Black Friday, having only done one transaction in one store in San Francisco. They rolled it out across the entire globe, so if that makes any of you sweat, you can imagine how we felt. Uh, we transacted a billion dollars on that first Friday, um, and it, was you know, success from that. Um, I've done big software, I've done um, Cvent. You know, we're, we grew at over 100% compound annual growth for three years straight. That's a lot of growth, it's a lot of hiring, it's a lot of change, it's a lot of shifting around who does what and how teams work, uh, that was crazy. Um, and then now I'm at the Home Depot and I'm a product, management, product manager there focused on how do we take all this goodness that we have inside of a brick and mortar retail store that serves pr predominantly consumer users, do-it-yourselfers, right? We created that term. And how do you get that and get it out into the hands of professional contractors, the people who are buying a hundred times more volume of products at a given time, you know, they're doing a 138 unit apartment complex. It's a very different product purchase than I need light bulbs. So it's a fun challenge, it's a big challenge. You know, we're a $100 billion company. Um, so everything we do has a massive impact and a potential to break things massively. Um, so really fun challenges there. And uh, anyways, a really broad spectrum of scale and happy to talk about more of that with any of you later if you are interested. But I wanna get back to what we're talking about. So a leader is inclusive. Now, the word inclusive has many, many meanings. Um, I know there's, uh, you know, we could dig into how, do you, how are you being inclusive around uh, people that are different than you? Um, how are you inclusive with various stakeholders? 
that is all true. We're not going to quite go that deep into inclusive. What I want to talk about more is the idea that you've probably all seen more examples of poor leadership than good, sadly. Um, and I see smiles and laughter because, you know, it's pretty easy to pick out poor leadership. And it's usually because uh, it's someone who's controlling a meeting. Um, it's the one who everyone waits because they know they're just going to take over anyways. And so let's just let them do their thing. Um, we call it command and control. Like this dude, you know, they're not there following that leader, right? They're there because he is clearly the one in command and is owning this meeting. And so, yes, they're sitting at attention, but are they really committed? Are they, you know, do they want to follow this guy as a leader? Probably not. So power or assigned authority does not equate to leadership. That is not a correlation, right? So we know lots of politicians that live in a power structure, not in a leadership structure, right? People don't want to follow them. They have just made their way to where they are. And you can tell in the way they talk to people. And you can tell how someone interacts with other people where they kind of fit in the spectrum of, of good to poor leadership, right? So what we want to think about is, you know, the, the good leaders and what sort of makes them stand apart from these bad examples we've seen or these kind of ones we get frustrated with or maybe we know we don't like kind of being around them, we can't quite pinpoint what that is. A good leader is inclusive in the sense that they want everyone around them to be successful. The idea that we're all playing for the same team, that we're all here working on, you know, in, in a company situation, we're working towards a similar goal. We don't always quite match up on how we think about that goal, but a good leader will help people get there together, right? So they will get people on board, they'll get people excited, motivated towards uh, the problem space. Um, we'll work to make sure that the people who are being real quiet off the side have a chance to, to voice thoughts and opinions. Um, a, a good leader knows that they become successful as everyone becomes successful, right? There is, there is no zero-sum game in leadership. It's not, if I don't rise above you, then you're going to rise above me, and, and that's the only scenario, it's an either-or. It's a both-and. We can all be successful together. We can all improve. Um, and so one of the, the interesting things, as you think about good leadership, the more you're benefiting others, the more you're giving, the more you're helping, the more people are willing to do that back to you. So there's moments where you have what's needed, and you can share that. And there's moments where they have maybe what you need. And because you have extended that, they're usually willing to extend that back. And the beautiful thing is, is as that happens, you're all leveling up, right? If you're a manager of other people and you're helping them be successful, you're celebrating their wins, um, making sure everyone knows they were participating in this project, it's not like because you didn't sing your praises, suddenly no one remembers you were part of that team. And in fact, as you're doing that and they're growing in their abilities, in their skills, maybe moving up in role, you move up too. Like that's kind of the, the logical progression, right? Um, in fact, a really good leader will make their boss look amazing as often as possible because what's the easiest way to move up in an organization? You wanna wait till someone quits <laughs> and hope a role opens up? You wanna wait till you grow big enough that another role that's, you know, the next one up for you opens up? Or do you wanna get your boss promoted? Get them out of the way, right? So. Make them look good, they move up, and because you're the one making them look good, guess where you go? You move up too, right? It doesn't always happen one for one. I'm not saying it's like some magical formula, but the idea is that think about how you, know, you being able to give, to share, to connect is a much better place to go in every day to work. Even if you don't get the promotion right away, won't you be happier along the way as you're doing that? Now, all that said, part of being inclusive uh, is not just that it's like, you know, kumbaya, rah, rah, yay. Remember I talked about having an opinion. So you walk into a meeting and let's say your well-meaning manager, you know, none of you are here, I'm sure, came in, has got this brand new OKR. They're like, we are going to run double the number of tests this year. And so I need you guys to, to track that and we're going to measure it. Because obviously if you test twice as much, it's twice as safe and twice as quality, right? This, no? 
No? Okay. See, I'm not a, I'm not a QA person. So, um, but that's their OKR. But you could sit there and go, well, they're the boss. All right, run those tests twice as often. You know, they said to, that meets their OKR, and we're all happy, and we've got our key result, and done. Or you can actually come with your, your thoughtfulness, your opinion, and in this case, like, uh, like Scotty, right? He challenges the captain on the Star, Star Trek on the Enterprise. When he tells him, no, we can't do that, you're gonna blow the engines, right? Like, we can't jump right now, something's wrong. I have to tell you what that is. That's my job as engineer. Your job is to say, actually, we should run less of this test and maybe about 25% more of this one to actually, because beyond that, you're, you're at sort of 99% surety. After that, like that next 1%, you'd have to do 10 times as many tests. And that doesn't make sense, right? And for you to actually share that, to use data to say, I understand how the tests work. I understand what you want to achieve with your objective but let's talk about how to achieve that the right way. Maybe, maybe we adjust your objective and I will make you look good because we will spend less dollars running fewer tests and do the right ones, right? So you have to come with your opinions. Again, that is you collaborating with someone who is above you, who maybe it's not in that moment, if you know their, their personality and they're not really able to hear things <laughs> during a meeting, that's okay, right? Know your situation, but you still need to go in there. What's up, Mark? Uh, you still need to go in there with, with your brain, with your data, with your understanding, because they're actually relying on you. They're hoping that you will give them what they need to, again, look good, right? You make them look good, they get promoted, you move up into their role. Um, the other thing to think about, too, is this idea of assists. So in most sports, we track, for a long time, they really just tracked shots, goals, score, like in, in some way that you ratcheted up the number for the team was the stat, that was the important one. And then they realized, well, yeah, because of that, people started to become ball hogs. Because I don't get credited if I throw the ball to you, if I kick the ball to you, if I you know, hand off to you. But if you track assists, the idea that whoever was the last one that provided that ball to the, the player who scores gets credited with an assist. So this idea that, and you look at Donovan's numbers here, over time, the blue ones are his assists, red or pink, whatever color that is, or his goals, they're pretty equal when you kind of add them up and, and average them out over time. That says a lot because he probably couldn't have scored as many as he scored if his teammates weren't also willing to pass the ball to him to shoot, right? And that idea of kind of shared responsibility, working together, um, it applies in the workplace too. So it's not just in sports, the idea of by you giving the assist sometimes, sometimes you also make the play, right? Someone else is gonna help you along the way. All right, so a leader is also responsible. So one of the things with responsibility, can, can anyone tell me the difference between oversight and responsibility? All right, I won't make you answer that. I will answer it for you. But if you think about oversight versus responsibility, if it's really all about who does the action. So as a, as a boss, I could come in and say, you are now running the project on test harnesses. Okay, I have given you oversight of a project. You may not be committed. You may not care. You don't want to be responsible for it but you have been given this task that you now own, right? There's ownership there. Um, the difference though, when you take responsibility is it's all in the language, right? We say take responsibility. Responsibility can't be given. I can't make you responsible. I can make you owner of the project, but I cannot make you assume the responsibility that it is successful. Like you might just do the minimum. You might not care. You might not do it at all. You owned it, you just didn't even do it. So the idea that as a leader you want to take responsibility is a very, very critical shift in thinking in that, all right, I've been given things you know, all day long. Sure, you might get assigned things, but are you gonna take responsibility for them and actually do your best to see that they're done right, they're done well, that the right people are involved, you get it done, you get to the end. Um, so this, this concept is, uh, is kind of has two halves to it. So when you take responsibility, um, you could be found being the one who is constantly applauding the team that helps you, right? You're always pointing out 
who was involved. Something went really well, you're pointing out who was involved, who did it, who helped. Uh, when things fail, there's only one, one finger point, right? That's taking responsibility. Like, I own this. It was mine. I own the project. I didn't think about some of these other scenarios. The team did an amazing job, but, you know, I've, I'm, I'm learning, right? I figured out that, that I, I missed and we're going to fix it, right? So you're taking ownership. You're shielding the team, even though they may join in and go, you know, we were there too. It's all right. But you still stood out and said, no, I owned this thing. I, I'm responsible and I'm willing to be responsible. Um, so we're going to talk about test harnesses, not like this kind of harness. It's not what we're talking about. Um, so let's say again, back to that example. You've been told by your boss, hey, we want to implement these test harnesses so that we can do more automation. We can get more things getting tested faster. And you're all sitting around and kind of like, eh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But if you volunteer, let's say you know nothing about this. You're like, I've heard of them. I don't really know what they do. I don't know how they work. But I'm willing. I'm going to step out and say, sure, I'll, I'll kind of lead the charge. Let's figure out if we can go from manual implementations over to these kind of automated, like plug our software right in and it starts testing. That'd be cool. I kind of want to learn about that. So you volunteer. You now lead a team. You do, do some work. You figure it out. You could just be like, all right, so great, I volunteered, took extra time, and whatever, right? That's that. But what you don't realize is that by picking yourself, by standing out saying, yeah, I'm going to do this, you now have moved into this new sphere, right? You're no longer in your corner of the world doing your thing. You're now on kind of a new stage where you're interacting potentially with new, new players in the organization. Maybe there's other folks on, um, on the automation side you don't normally talk to. Suddenly, you're asking them questions. Um, you're bringing in some, some developers who are going to maybe be the first ones to do this. So you start to expand your sphere of interaction, your sphere of influence. Um, and then pretty soon you're seen as a subject matter expert. You went from, I didn't know anything about this, to people coming and asking you about, hey, you were working on the test harnesses, right? Um, I'm thinking about joining in the next round of, of devs who are doing that. And can I, can I get the documentation? Can I see what you learned? Can you maybe like talk to me? And suddenly, you're elevated, right? You're now someone who is looked to as, as a leader, as someone who's got experience, who's got um, knowledge that people don't have. And it wasn't that hard. You just volunteer, do the work, go after it. So the third piece is a leader is trustworthy. So we talked about um, being inclusive, talked about being responsible, taking responsibility, uh, and now there's trustworthiness. So when you lead, there's no guarantees that anyone will follow you, right? That's just how it is. <laughs> you, you actually can't make someone follow you. You can be an authoritarian or a dictator, and you can force people to listen or take action, but you can't fundamentally make someone want to follow you by, uh, by force. So the only way to do that is to earn trust, right? And so just like Responsibility is taken, trust is earned. So you cannot uh, force that out, you can't make that happen. Um, but how do you earn trust? Well, I'm uh, a fan of Seth Godin, who writes a lot on marketing and other things. And fundamentally, in marketing, you have to earn trust, right? You're trying to promote a thing, advertise a thing, and you want people to respond to that. You want them to take action. So you have to earn trust. But how do you earn trust? It's not some magical, you know, do this and they'll trust you, it's drip by drip. And that's one of the common themes that, that Seth talks about. Yeah? What do I think of? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So just in case everyone didn't hear, how do you, how do you balance the sort of day-to-day, day -day, the drip by drip with like casting a bigger vision and getting people excited about sort of uh, like going to the moon? You know, how do you, how do you do that? I think it's both. I think as a, as a leader, again, you're, you're saying, I see something beyond test harnesses, I see the view ahead of us freeing up developers and quality engineers' time who are doing all these manual steps every time so that they're starting to use their brains again instead of just doing like, you know, essentially secretarial work to implement these tests. And they're now moving on to thinking about the software as a whole and how we can make better software. We can maybe look at new, new tools, new, new ways to do this. So you start to cast a vision. But at the same time, that trust is built by, again, 
the day-to-day -day interactions of do you, do you see me as part of your team and do you recognize when I'm contributing and celebrate me? Um, do you uh, extend those invitations to like, participate in the things you're doing? Um, do you take responsibility or do you blame? Uh, all those like bit by bit. That's the, the trust is earned in little bits, even though vision can be cast and could even be caught by people pretty early on. They'll, they'll tiptoe after you at first, but they'll really begin to follow you and be committed because the trust builds as they see, I'm, I'm sticking with my vision, I'm not changing you know, all the time. We're not going to the moon, we're going to Mars. We're not going to Mars, we're going to the bottom of the ocean. We're not going to, like if, if that's happening, you're killing trust. But when you stay consistent in your message, you continue to bring people along. It's a really great question. I think um, I'm a firm believer that there is very few things, there are certain things that are black and white or this or that in life. There's many both ends. It's kind of, you can have a big vision and a far out look and you can also focus on day to day. Um, you can be striving for your own success and also be helping other people succeed. So I think there's a lot of kind of this both, both and when you think about leadership. Um, but it really does, it comes down to people, right? We are building software, most of us. Um, it's not about the software, it's about the, the people, right? Software comes and goes, code bases come and go, the, the various strategies and vision of the company will shift over time, companies pivot, but the people are what, what make it great. And I think that you stepping into that, that leadership space is really important. And this, one of the best ways to earn trust is when things go wrong. You earn like at least twice the amount of trust um, when you handle yourself well when things fail or things, you know, a project doesn't work or you miss a deadline or uh, the code, you know, crashes and, and something goes down. How you handle yourself and how you interact with the people around you when that occurs earns you at least twice as much trust as when things go well and you celebrate people. They both work. But it's, you know, things always go wrong. They're gonna go wrong. How you, how you handle yourself in those times is super, super important. And being able to say, like, I'm sorry, you know, I did not think of this scenario. Or I forgot a stakeholder who might have had information that could have prevented this thing from occurring. Um, <clears throat> you know, whatever you need to do to kind of, like, again, I, I got this. This is not on me. We had a, we had a great team really working here, but I missed. Those moments are super powerful, especially when you're not freaking out, you're not screwing at people. Like, maybe not, not in like that one instance, but as that happens over and over, people are like, yeah, I wanna be by that, that guy over here, you know? I don't, I don't wanna be by the one that freaks out and screams and yells and, you know, some of it's personality, but you gotta, you gotta control your personality when it comes to failure, things running amok. I mean, right, software is, it's like a coin flip. It's gonna work really great, it's gonna fail, like, it, like day to day, like things go wrong all the time, but that's the life we live in, and so how you handle that is super, super important. All right, so let's say we're gonna go back to this test harness. You know, one of these times, some of you will explain what a test harness is. Just kidding. Um, test harness project, let's say you do a bunch of work, okay? You, extra hours, You've pulled in five, six you know, people who are helping you and, and doing some of the, the pre-work and the testing. Is this thing gonna work? Can we do this? And you get to the end of it and you actually realize we're faster manually than just it's the way our code base is than with these kind of automated test harnesses. I don't think this is the right way to go. Let's just say that's a scenario, okay? So you've done this work. Boss said who's gonna do it. You volunteer, you do it, and you realize yeah, I don't, I don't think this gets us where you thought it was gonna get us, right? So that's the answer you've come up with. Uh, at this point, you have several options. So here they are. You could say, hey, we worked hard. The boss was wrong. <laughs> this was not the right solution, right? That's an option. We hear that all the time, right? Blame someone else, this was not my fault. Um, you could say nothing, really. Kind of crawl back to your corner of the world and just go, you know, it was a volunteer thing. Didn't work out, oh well, don't make a big deal out of it. Kind of just slide off to the side and, and disappear back to what you were doing before. And we see that a lot. You could blame the team. You know, I didn't have the resources to be set up for success. I didn't have the people I needed. I didn't have the expertise. Uh, I couldn't get people to 
volunteer time, you know, where? <laughs> which again, I'm sure you have all heard at some point, right? Uh, and then there's a fourth option, which I think is the right option, and that is you own it. Hey, I led this team. We did some really great work. However, this solution does not work for us, for our code base, for what we want to achieve. To that end, I've asked a couple of people from the team to spend a little bit more time, and we're working on some other options that we might want to look into. So we had that idea. Here's a couple of those. In fact, we're really excited about A, B, and, and C. Give us a little time, and, and we'll get there. Raise the team, own the failure, and suggest alternatives, right? That's quality leadership. You come to the end of this project, you realize it's not gonna, not gonna work out like you thought it was. Most people do one of the top two is okay leadership. The third one is the one people forget about all the time. Bring new alternatives. Just take a minute, think about it. Don't just be like, yeah, that was terrible. Don't critique without options to make it better. That will make you stand out like so much more than most people, right? Who just want to come in and be like, it was wrong, or it was bad, or this didn't work, or that didn't work. Great, that's true, we already know that. <laughs> that's why you're here telling us. But what, what else could we do? Or is it really, we have no way to get to automation, so throw our hands up in the air, but I would say that's probably wrong. So what are some options? Then you could go back to your boss and say, hey, could we get some funding? or time or whatever to pursue one of these because we see some, some kind of inklings here that look good. Like this could work, this could work well. Do you have a question? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, tell, uh, I tell folks this a lot. We never hire developers or engineers to produce code. Code is an output. You, you hire people to think. You hire quality engineers, you hire software engineers, you hire them to think. They want you solve problems, and the output of that ends up being code, ends up being you know, various outputs. So you know, I expect people, especially people who are paid a lot to do the, a, a very complicated job, to, to be asking questions, to be bringing data to uh, you know, a sprint planning or a review session or whatever, to be asking those things like, okay, I, I hear this solution, but have we also thought about these? Or we're struggling here. Uh, I've heard about options that could do X, Y, and Z. Those, like wherever you see that, bring that out in people, right? More of that, more of that, more of that. And that can be part of your leadership too, is just encouraging, making space for people to bring up those ideas and share them. And yeah, it, that's a super crucial thing. Um, I think highly underrated in like interviewing and trying to find people who are thoughtful. Um, you know, people are really good at be doing what they're told. It's hard to find people who are good at thinking and are good at um, thinking along with others and collaborating and coming to, you know, solutions. So uh, this is actually a photo of uh, some of the teammates here at Cvent. Um, so as I wrap up thinking about leadership, you know, the, whether it's in a quality setting or any setting, it really doesn't matter. The point is, most of our jobs are about people, right? About the team. Um, jobs come and go. Careers are long, you know. And and the people that are around you, you know, whether that's in your current job, in your past job, you, you probably stay in touch with many of them, or at least the good ones, right? Um, you want to be one of those good ones. <laughs> you you want to be one of those people. Um, but it's it was fun. I like dug through and found this. This uh, uh, several of these folks are still here, and and some are not. Uh, but I stay in touch with most all of them. And so, you know, when you, when you have leadership, and we struggled a lot as leaders, and I think I was telling Sullivan this uh, earlier, you know, we, we used to talk about each other as these pillars, you know, these different leaders, groups, and it, it almost made us be more combative, in a sense, because you're a pillar, right? You can't change me or move me. Um, and it wasn't until we finally uh, came to the realization that we we're more like rope and we're the strands of rope. And if that rope is fraying, if someone's not in unison with the others, then the rope is failing. Not one person, the entire rope is failing. And guess who that rope is failing for? People up above you. And they're gonna notice, and they're gonna come down and be like, why, why can't you guys get it together? 
I guess I'm gonna have to decide for you, right? That's the worst position to be in is to have someone come down and solve your problems for you when you really ought to be able to do it yourself. So um, yeah, being, being thoughtful about people, about your team around you, how can you expand that team is, is really, really important. Don't get so fixated on the tasks at hand that you forget that you're sitting next to, around, above, below people, right? And that's the day-to-day -day, uh, that we live in. So I, I really honestly believe that you will find uh, your happiness increases the more you give and share with others, the more you take responsibility and give praise to those around you, and the more you build trust in good times and especially in bad, uh, you will become more of a leader. And it doesn't have to be some big magical transformation. These can happen in little bits, in little ways, in whatever role you find yourself in now. You don't have to wait till you get some new job next and try it out then. You can literally go home and come into work tomorrow and try this stuff, right? Bring your opinion. Act like you own the company. Go, hey, I know about how much it costs to have this many people in this room. Is this how much we want to spend solving this problem? You know, sometimes it just takes someone asking the question and it gets people going, yeah, that's probably kind of silly, right? That we have this many leaders in one room and we're just arguing over some minutia of, <laughs> of detail. Like, okay, who's gonna own this? Go, you go solve it and we'll move on to something else, right? So come in, have an opinion, act like you own the place. Uh, I've never encountered pushback because people are looking for people to take on responsibility, right? People above you love that. I love it when people underneath me are just like, hey, I knew we needed this, so I went and did it. I'm just like, thank you. <laughs> yes, like, because you're making me look good. And now I'm gonna do what I can to make you look good. And this, like, that's how this works. So that is what I have tonight. Remember, tomorrow you can become more of a leader. So don't wait, start right away. Uh, this is my info. You can reach out and say hello. I'm always happy to talk. I, I respond to those emails. Um, and then you can find all my, my social and all that stuff on there. So whatever happens, whatever network you happen to be on, <laughs> I'm probably there. But with that, I think we have some time, yeah? Um, more questions. I appreciate you guys were just asking questions along the way. But uh, more thoughts, like more scenarios that you want to ask about, maybe at your own work, uh, we can discuss. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, so I'm a senior level person you know, in our office, and so there's a, there's a tendency that when I come into a meeting that people sort of default to they want to look at me and see if I have the answer. Um, but I have people on my team who have the answer. And many times they have more of the answer than even I do. And so one of the ways that I try to make sure that people understand sort of who has what and who has the ability to answer the question is I will redirect and I'll just say, well, actually, you know, Kelly's got all that information. In fact, you know, she's got a great document to probably be able to share with you. Um, and so I try to point out team members. And again, that's, that's me highlighting that they did the work. It's me highlighting that they're responsible enough to be asked directly and you don't have to come to me, that it's not some gating process. I'm not constraining them. Um, I will also then bring in, so I do, I do product management, so I have you know, PM and junior PMs, you know, different layers below me. And so I will bring people into the next level up uh, type of meetings. So if you don't normally do strategy, I'll bring you in the strategy meeting and I'll tell you I'm bringing you into the strategy meeting and I want you to, to, you know, if you've never done this, I want you to watch, pay attention, take notes, and then we'll talk about it later. If you've done some of it, then I'll, I'll see if, you know, are you, do you feel confident enough to contribute and be a part of this? Do you wanna, you know, where do you wanna engage? So I'll, I'll try to bring people along um, so that they have those opportunities to kind of level up themselves, right? And say, in a, in a safe way, right? Wherever I can make that a safe environment so that someone's not like, I wanna move up, but I don't know when I get the chance to do it, right? And sometimes people feel stuck. So again, that sort of trying to figure out how do I enable the people around me? Because again, the more they're like more of the people around me are doing more work, the more we're all getting done, right? That's freeing me up to then move on to the next thing. And if that means we're growing and then we're gonna hire more people, good, right? That's where you want to be. So whenever you can find opportunities to include other people, to um, give people the floor, give them space, um, 
also recognize, you know, we did, I didn't talk a lot about it, but, you know, uh, personality types, uh, different genders, whatever, you know, will interact differently in a room. And depending on how many people are in that room, um, some people will remain really quiet and may not say anything. So if you see a pattern like that, then try different, different methods of interacting. Hey, I want you guys to post it notes. So I want everyone to write down two ideas for this thing we're about to talk about before we get started, because everyone can write, right? No one's afraid to write and hand in a post it note. Um, that's a way, another way of including, and, and people feel that. They recognize, like, oh, you saw me. You realize I'm super shy and I don't like to talk in the meetings. Um, it's just it's subtle, right? You're not saying it that way, but you're 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 creating those opportunities um, so that everyone's engaging in the way that they feel, you know, comfortable with, and then hopefully they keep growing and moving beyond that over time. Um, but it's just it's being sensitive to again. You, you're not. It's not always about the task at hand. We're going to solve a thing today. We're going to go in the meeting, and you know, especially. Uh, kind of the American ethos is just like, get in there, get it done, get out, and move on, right? But it's the people who are gonna get it done. So we have to continually, as leaders, bring ourselves back to thinking about like, who's here, who's not here that should be, who's not here that could be, not even should, but like, could just be an opportunity for them to sit in. Um, who can I let, you know, present or demo when I normally do it? Give them the floor, give them an opportunity, let people see them as the contributor that they are, potentially the leader that they are. Uh, so there's, there's many, many ways, but it's like our job is to continually look for those and make sure we're you know, creating those safe spaces, creating those openings, um, that we're not, we're not just always driving through to an outcome because then you, you miss so many great interactions when you do that. Yes? So I, um, there's a piece that you mentioned where you want to make your manager look good for the group you're working with. So on the same point, what would your strategy be when you're dealing with higher management? Hmm. How would you, it's not it's different personalities, how do you deal with them? Yeah, so how do you make your, making your direct manager look good is, is not always that hard, but making people further up the, the line look good. Um, it, it probably depends based on different situations, but um, one of the things that I've, I've learned is that people forget how little everyone else understands is going on. <laughs> At a large level, right, we all know kind of what the company's doing, maybe big releases are going on, whatever. But at the smaller level, you don't really, like in your sphere, you're like, yeah, of course, we all know what's going on. But like walk 10 feet away and people are probably like, what are you working on? <laughs> you know, you don't have to go far. You don't have to go to like the, the next office in another town, which is often, you know, now 10 times harder to keep them up to date. So what I've found over my career is that more communication is better than less. And uh, I will do stuff like I will send out a, an update and I will include a bunch of people that I wouldn't normally include and just say, hey, I send this update out on a regular basis. Do you want to stay on this? Like, do you want to be a regular recipient of this? Um, I've coached other kind of introverted like UX designers, like how do you highlight what you do in design if you're not the one who wants to stand up and present your designs? Um, so I've, I've had people like create the every other week newsletter. Here's what design's working on. And so now it's coming from their name People responding to them. Um, we did it here at, at Cvent, and that one turned into like the CEO on down actually emailed to request to get on this email list because they wanted to see. It was inspiring. Like, here's what we're solving. Here's our wish list as designers. I wish engineers would solve this, and the product people would take this on. Um, here's little tidbits about kind of the overall product. So it became this like really great re resource, and it leveled up that that person as a leader, right? They're, they're taking the time to do that. So it doesn't have to look the same all the time, but uh, when, you, yeah, when you're moving up the line, it's really about, they got a whole lot of other things going on, so how can you find ways to make sure that you're, you're sending, and, and ideally you're sending celebrations of the team and, the, and the, the work that's going on, and maybe the pathway forward of kind of how you're seeing things improve, so that they, they have a chance to recognize that, and it's, it, it, is a little bit self-serving, um, 
But as long as it's not just like, you know, and Andy did this, and Andy did that, and Andy did this, and Andy did that, right? Like you're talking about, hey, you know, we're pushing the bounds of automated testing. And I thought you should know these are the kind of things we're doing, and the team's doing this, and, you know, I let a, a you know, deeper dive into the test harnesses, and we're, we're going to go forward with them. And, like, people love that up above. They're like, wow. I actually have great people <laughs> doing the work I can feel confident about, right? That, that's a good thing. So would this be, would you say it's daily or quarterly? Or? Yeah, da daily is going to be too much. So you think about, like, it depends, again, the level. Um, if you're working your way up to, like, VPs and, and above, um, just a snapshot, right? Almost like, think cartoon. <laughs> if I could send them a, a single post-it note with a drawing on it, like, what would I draw on that post-it note? And then is that something I could write in sentences? Do I need a picture? Do I need a little video demo? Um, they usually can't find the time to make it to a, a demo. So record it. It's not that hard. Send them the link. They don't have to watch it, but they got it. They know you're doing work. And if they are interested, they'll look. And if they want to know more, they'll reply back. And when you get the reply back, then you know you got them, right? You hooked them, you got their attention, they're interested, they now understand you know, more about what's going on in that segment of the business, and that's a good thing, right? It feels risky, it feels scary, because like, uh-oh, now they're looking down. It's scarier that they don't know what you do. Trust me, <laughs> that's how you get eradicated. <laughs> well, I don't know what all these quality people do. Why are we spending all this money, what the hell? Like, it, you know, we can get rid of all of them, can't we? Don't we automate everything? Why do we know these humans? I'm not kidding, this happens. So like, you don't want them not knowing what you do, but you want them knowing at a level that makes sense, that's digestible, that's useful for their day-to-day -day interactions, and they go and meet with the CFO, and the CFO's going, we're spending so much money on quality, and they're like, yes, because, you know, Cvent is one of the number one, you know, native app publishers by volume in the world. Do you want to screw that up? Anyone? No, we don't want to screw that up? Okay. So you're going to pay for this many quality engineers. <laughs> That's how this works, right? But you needed to give them that ammunition to understand, like, why. So yeah, don't don't ever feel like you know. Again, not not too much is is never enough. But like, on a, some sort of regular cadence that they're understanding the work you're doing. You know, it could just be one level up from your boss. You send it to your boss and add their boss. You never just send it over their head. Um, but make it, you know, a format that is this is helpful. Like, hey, it's what we're working on. I'm celebrating wins. We're, you know, we're knocking down bugs. We're whatever. Because they probably get that stuff all summarized and charted and hideously terrible to digest, you know, on a, some regular basis. So to have just like a snapshot of a single area of their business is, is kind of nice. It's refreshing. It's different. Again, leader, right? You're standing out. You have an opinion about your world and why you're valuable. You know, if they tell you, like, I don't want this, then okay, that's different. But most will at least enjoy seeing that, occasionally clicking on the stuff you send them, and that's good, just like it would be for an email newsletter, right? That's about all you can expect is the occasional open and the click through, and okay, but, I, but you're getting it. You see my name on there every time that email comes in, it came from me, right? That's a good thing. Um, so don't be afraid of kind of taking on that role of like, let me celebrate, let me celebrate the team. And by, by nature of doing that, I'm celebrating myself too. No, that's a, that's a really great, uh, really great question that, you know, we are all so vastly different, right? Um, there are, I can easily, you know, rattle off several engineers that I would never want to stand in front of anyone and speak to anyone about anything, ever, never, ever. And in fact, I would hesitate to have them write something up and send it to other people. Like they're just, they don't have, like the code's awesome, but the code with other humans is just, it's like, no, you can't, can't do it. In those kind of instances, like, you know, help them out. If they did the important work, then you write up the summary and point the finger back at them. And most of those kind of people don't, you know, would never want to write that up and send it out or speak in front of people. Um, and that's okay. That is perfect. In fact, I've, I've had where, you know, the engineer demos and they're at the computer and you, they're like profusely sweating. They don't have to speak, they don't have to do anything, but because there's people that are watching the demo, 
they're literally about to die inside. Someone else speaks, or you speak and let them do the demo, but they're there, they're seen, and you point out that like, this is an amazing solve. We were beaten up on this problem for so long, and Jennifer over here, she had it. She like, the idea was just like, oh, and it worked, and check it out, and like, this is so awesome. So you celebrate when they can't. Um, other times, like I said, I had uh, the designer who was literally would make a drunken sailor blush with her language. Um, I could not have her standing up and speaking to people about design. I needed her to write it down because when she wrote it down, she could delete all the, <laughs> the inappropriate words. And so for her, that was the solve. We, had to, we worked through a few different options until we came up with, why don't you do a newsletter? that highlights what's going on. And that was this, you know, m me trying to, you know, manage HR things, but also it was the right fit for her because she wasn't really that kind of like stand up in front and, and talk to people. So part of leadership is, in, and when you talk about inclusivity, is like figuring out who people are and helping them grow. And maybe they need to push a little bit on certain areas. And sometimes it's like, yeah, you're probably never gonna speak in front of people. That's all right. But if you send me a summary and a link to the demo, I'm gonna broadcast that because I need to celebrate you. I need people to know what you're doing because you're changing how our company works. So it's important. So then they go, okay, all right, well, I don't like it, but all right, I'll give you the stuff, right? So figure out who you're working with and if you have more outgoing people that are just sort of embarrassed, don't wanna to talk, tough, get them talking, right? Get them up in front, you, or, hey, you're doing the demo today. What? I, yeah, I'm, cause I can't, I can't be here and then you just go around the corner, right? You're doing it, force them. Right, because so, you know those people. Something like that. You know they can talk. You know they have the ability to do it. They just don't want to or aren't ready. Maybe you start in by just sharing it in a smaller meeting where they talk. That's a first step, right? And then eventually you work up to the bigger, like all hands or whatever. Um, so find those areas. As you do that, again, you're building trust with them. You're saying, I, I need you to celebrate you, and I'm either going to help you or I'm going to help sort of push you and guide you. They get more excited, they're more happy to partner with you and work, so again, it, it does come back, but you have to think about the individual and, and what the scenarios are, and it's not a one size fits all. Uh, not everyone wants to do this and stand up in front of people and talk. Um, that's okay, but if you can, you stand out from like 99.9% .9 of almost everyone else. So wherever those opportunities are, right, those are helping you stand out, helping you be remembered, helping you know, people think of, of you as an expert in something. Um, those, are, those are powerful. So if you can enable your, your team in different ways to do that, um, they're gonna love you for it. They're gonna wanna follow you as a leader. Um, they're gonna you know, be happier in their role because now they're sort of pushing out to new boundaries and finding success in that is it's really valuable, right? And that's, it's great for retention, it's great for just the human interaction level, the happiness, you know, on a team. Um, those are real things. We can try to ignore them, but they come back to bite you if, if you do. Yeah, um, a lot of that, what you're asking about is, is more around culture. So is, is your comp does your company have a culture that celebrates failure in, in light of what you learn from? So in other words, are you an innovative company? And if you are, then you should be pushing the boundaries and you should be finding where those boundaries fail. 
right? And that's that is how you that's how you do it, right? I mean, if you look at a venture capital firm, they're going to invest in ten companies and hopes that two succeed and do really well, and maybe if they're lucky, one or two more do okay, and all the rest are going to fail. But if I only invest in one, then that's a really big risk. So I have to invest in ten. That's how I get the two. Um, in the same way, you got to think about your culture. And if your culture is that many people feel that way, like we're afraid to fail, then you think about where does that come from? Is it is it the CEO who has you know some sort of uh, you know strict standards? Is it you know the group you're in? Is it engineering? Is it you know where does that come from? And can you start to influence like? Hey, I understand we don't like failing. I mean, at Home Depot, like I said, we've got 2,000 stores. And if we ship software to 2,000 stores that are live and selling products and that thing breaks, you know, it's, I don't even know. We, we should probably calculate it sometime. How many, like, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars per minute <laughs> that we could potentially be losing? Like, this isn't just a like, oops, oh well, we moved fast and broke stuff. Like, you, you know, that, that's not that environment. However, you can create a culture that says, yes, the thing that is in production needs to be really stable and there's a reason for it. However, we have devised a way to test things in that environment that if they were to break, immediately flip back to the old thing. Or, you know, we only test it in, in limited scenarios so that only so many you know, stores don't have access to some part, right? So you think about how do you limit risk, um, but that's part of that culture, right? Can you create a culture that says, I need you trying to write software or test software in ways that will, that will fail at times, and we'll actually put those up, and we'll show those that are retrospective, and we'll be like, check this one out. We thought this was so cool, fell on his face. Doesn't work at all. Have any of you guys got anything like that? You know, and then someone else be like, well, yeah, we tried this and it didn't work. All right. Like, and can you celebrate those? But what did you learn? Well, we learned that no one knows the core kernel of our software because the guys who wrote it are all gone now and we don't know what we break when we build stuff. Okay. That's some really important learning. Okay. Let's put that up on, you know, on the board that says, who's going to go figure out how this thing works at its you know, nucleus, so we stop breaking things. Right? That's a good learning to have, but if you can't celebrate, if you can't talk about it, and then say, this is what we learned, how we're gonna move forward, then people are afraid. They don't, then they'll be like, I'll just write really safe patches around the edges and not go too deep, and you just create lots of tech debt, lots of rigidity, lots of problems, right? You guys know this. Um, but if you can think about you know, driving for, like, let's understand what that thing does and how it works, so we can then write software that's smart, that doesn't break, or has less chance of breaking. That's a really great outcome. But you gotta figure out your culture that says, how do we create an environment that says, I don't need you to know everything. And we're gonna, everything we ship has feature flags, so I can turn it on and off. I don't have to ship everything. Sure, we're doing continuous integration, continuous deployment, everything's out there on the web and, and on the cloud, and it's ready, it's all off. It's a safe way to do it, right? So you can then play with feature flags. You can then roll out in certain markets. You can test things. You can play around. You can turn it off. And when it fails, you go, yeah, it failed. But we turned it right off, <laughs> and we went back. So you got to think about your culture. Where can you push and start to say, do, do we need to open this up more and say, we need a culture of exploration? Or is it, you know, if you're in, like, medical <laughs> software, Maybe you don't, right? And it's different. We do testing in very limited, like, new things. And the known things are highly regulated and highly QA'd and highly, you know, through multiple environments before they ever get to production. And that's just the way it is because it is too expensive to risk someone's life. Okay? That's a culture where probably you, you, you want to figure out how you segment innovation from incremented work, right? And say, okay. When you're doing this, break it all. And then over here, we have a very rigid process, and we're going to follow that process. And that, you know, that might be the case. How do you want something to break? So you have a feature, and, it, and the feature crashes, you know it broke. If I use a firmware coupon and I can't use it, that, it can be the way that the customer understands the feature. It can be, in my case, we can go to the check stand and see if we could we try to there's like a half hour delay between when that's enabled on their site and when the capture happens. So how do you determine when things break? 
Mm. No, that's not. That's, a, that's almost an existential question. How do you how do you tell when things break? Um, no, what what's even what's even worse is how do you how do you tell what broke okay. the thing? That's another layer on top of that, right? So maybe you go, okay, the coupon doesn't work. Is it broken? Is it not broken? And was there something that actually did that? And was it a new release? But did the new release, and, and we've probably all experienced this, a new release triggered something else somewhere else that broke something else. Those are the worst ones to track down, right? Like the, something else is broken, but it's because of a new thing, but it, it wasn't, it didn't look connected. It's just that there was some shared service that now broke because of that. Um, it's a really, really tough challenge. Uh, I'm all, I don't have a great answer for how do you know when something breaks, other than, you know, you do need to think about your software in terms of what are its core functionalities, like what are the core structures of what you're delivering. And the more you can understand those and understand them in segments and how they relate to each other, the more you understand when you're building something new, what it might impact. And in many cases, people just code. They just go in, they add more code, they go in and comment something out and just start, you know, basically it just, you know, slapping new coats of paint over the top. And it's like, no one even remembers what the original building color was because there's so many coats of paint over the top. So how do you know why it's peeling right now? Was it the third layer, the fifth layer, the 12th layer? You don't. But that's a problem you can begin to unpack if you're already out there and you've got the 12 layers of paint. That's a, it's a commitment and time and resources to say, we're going to, as we do new work, begin segmenting pieces into logical chunks that we can begin to understand again because we've gotten so far. And this, you know, that's the case all the time, right? You build for scale now, you reach that scale and you go, oh crap. <laughs> and then you try to ratchet it up again and some of that code is still there, but now there's new stuff. And then you get to that scale and you go, oh, now we still, you know, we're hitting a wall. So then you kind of refactor some of it and then you add new stuff on top. And pretty soon, again, people have come and gone. No one even knows what the two systems before did or how they worked or why they, well, why is that thing even, you know, firing that API off to there? We don't even know what that's for. Like, you know, those are real problems, that's software, but it's figuring out, you know, what are the key pieces, who needs to understand those? And if you don't, that's an investment in future savings, right? To say, we need to break this into understandable groups and know when you code, you know, these are the kinds of things you can do here, these are things you can do here, and then you know you build in tests that look at things on a singular level as a feature and a test that looks across the platform and says you put a new thing in and that thing might break here but it might break anything across the entire stack so how do you that's where you know especially automation comes into play to say all right whenever something that is connected into this part of our system is to be deployed Here's 432 tests that just run automatically because it could break anything all the way down to the, you know, the very start. And we run a bunch of new tests in this area where we were actually doing the work. So that, that is one of those areas where like you have to work towards that and it takes time to build out what are those known tests, right? What are the things that keep breaking? How do we build in tests? And then how do we go, we're just testing a thing and it breaks every time? So it's time to fix that, <laughs> that thing is another element, right? There's, uh, sometimes it's in the deployment process, sometimes it's in, um, you know, people have co-located servers and cloud servers and pretty soon there's communication lags and it's actually that. It's not even the code that's breaking, it's just your system's gone, gone dark on you because <laughs> it's too overloaded and too stacked up. But th these are not uncommon problems. It's not like, you know, you can be a $100 billion company and have these exact same problems as a single person startup. It's just you, you make choices and, and compromises as you code and go, and then it just comes to the point where you go, I need to, I need to understand what I've done and potentially undo some of it so it stops breaking. All right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. If uh, if you have more questions, I would love to have them. I don't want to like keep everyone if anyone needs to go, but I think there's still time to hang out. There's food. I'll be here, you can ask me questions, and you can always uh, shoot me an email. I'm happy to chit-chat more and connect. So thank you, guys.